Well, I want to begin tonight with two special friends. And uh, I've had the privilege of knowing people in other parts of the world, which is such a wonderful thing. In CCDA, we are such a wonderful family. And we're a family not just here in the United States, but all over the world. And so this is Dr. Jember Tafara. Many of you have gotten to meet her from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And this is Reverend Jared Arseno from Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, they're both here with us and have been with us here at the conference. And so I, I just want them to say a word. And maybe, uh, Jared, would you just tell people what, what, you know, you come all the way from Nairobi. Uh, what does CCDA mean to you? CCDA means real people, people who have innovations. CDDA is eight components, but let me speak one component, relocation. It was not making sense to me when I came here in 2004 that I can relocate from a comfort zone where we have tapped water, where we have good roads, where we have electricity, where we have nice schools, to go to a slum, the largest slum in the whole world, where there are many needs, where there are no water, nothing, just nothing. So in this year, I just, God told me, if you need to do Christian community development, you need to locate. So when I located in February this year, I didn't get a big house the way the one I had where I was. So most of our staff is outside. So my children did not like it because this is a slum where they don't have friends, you know, and they are in a very good school. So it took time to learn what it means. But when I came to Kibera Slam, in these six months, I'm able to speak to 100 pastors, they have come together. And I've realized, when you live with leaders, one, they respect you, two, they love you, three, they respect you, and when you, you are together, you work as one for the kingdom of God. So Christ, um, CDDA means you need to be innovative all the time. All right. Thank you, Jared. I had the privilege of uh, being in uh, Jared's home in uh, Nairobi, and he and his wife cooked a wonderful meal for me, and we ate there uh, Kenyan style, where we eat with our hands and not with knives and forks, and uh, it, it was an unbelievable blessing for me. Here on my right is Dr. Jember Tafara. And she's been a special person in my life personally, in the life of my family, my wife Ann and Angela, our daughter, and Austin, our son. In fact, our son Austin just spent six weeks with Jember in Ethiopia and uh, is hoping even to go back to Ethiopia after he graduated from college. So Jember, you've been coming to many CCDA conferences, and uh, we just maybe like to hear a word from you, a little bit of, of what CCDA means to you, and just a word to us tonight. Um, I have known CCD as long as I have known you, almost. Um, I see that it's a Christ-like service to those who need help. And I see your ministry, um, hands-on ministry, um, really marrying two important um, verses in the Bible that I see. Matthew 28 and Matthew 25. You serve people with evangelism and you serve people uh, with ministries that uh, give the basic necessities uh, to human beings who, without your enabling them, maybe some of them would not even benefit from. So it's, as I said, a Christ-like benefit and I'm happy to be connected with it uh, as an urban slum worker. I uh, really appreciate what you do. A lot of our programs are also similar, so I really uh, appreciate what I learned from you. 
That's right. Amen. And what, when I came back, thank you. When I came back from Africa, the first Sunday I was home, I preached a course at Lawndale, and my, my sermon was entitled, Africa, My Teacher. And uh, Jember and Jared have been wonderful teachers for me. So thank you for joining us, and God bless you both. I also have asked uh, Brother Richard and Brother Mark to join me for just a moment, and so uh, as they're making their way uh, up here, I, I want to just uh, spend a couple minutes with them. We appreciate Brother Richard's talk last night, and uh, this actually began uh, this journey that we're beginning on here at CCDA began. Uh, last year with Brother Mark when he was on our panel. And one of the things that Mark said last year, those of you who heard him, he talked about how he felt violated and his home, or using the analogy of his grandmother's home, was it's like what happened to America, to his homeland, that it was invaded and people just started coming into his grandmother's house uninvited and began to just set up and cook and just live there and ransack the house. My wife Ann and I, Brother Mark, have talked about that in our home numerous times this past year. And we thank you for your ministry in our life in that. And of course, Brother Richard last night began us and began to help us in his talk, in his plenary session. He used wonderful humor, which, and even tonight when I was talking to him a few minutes ago, he, he cracked a joke and I didn't know it was a joke, but, <laughs> and then, they, you know, he put the little honky in his place and uh, it, was, it was good, I, I felt good about it. <laughs> but just tonight, um, on, on behalf of CCDA, you know, I've never given a Native American a gift. And it became apparent, and they're both board members, so we've had really good discussions on our board and we're just beginning. But, you know, whenever you go to someone's home, you usually bring a host gift. You bring a gift as you come. And so my wife Ann and I were thinking, what could we give to Brother Richard and Brother Mark? And it's a very simple gift, but we're not giving on, be, on our behalf, we're giving it on behalf of all of CCDA, and hopefully all of America can begin to understand this. And so it's just a little desk set, but on it it's engraved, Brother Richard, as he said, that's what we should call him, and Brother Mark, and it, this says, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. And then it's just signed, CCDA. So on behalf of CCDA, Brother Mark, Brother Richard, we now give you a host gift that is about 500 years, 600 years late, but it's from us because we appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Amen. Thanks. Thanks. Be seated. Thank you. Well, I thank you, Gordon, and thank you, uh, board members, and thank you, CCDA, uh, for graciously well honoring and welcoming us. And so uh, we have small things. So this is just a very small thing. Uh, this is a, a, a braided sweet grass, and among Lakota, we would burn this and use this in our prayers. So if I go to a ceremony, then I'm always going to take some tobacco or some sage and a piece of sweet grass. So this is something you can hang to remind you uh, that the Indians are looking at you. And uh, so whenever you see it there, uh, just remember we're watching. And uh, no, just a simple thing. 
just say thank you, Gordon, for those gifts. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like over the past uh, two or three years, the CCDA has really become a part of my family. And I know I've given several of the board members or of the founders this gift, but I wanted to give another, the same gift again tonight publicly so that all of CCDA could know that um, I want to continue to see this, this group, this body as a part of my family. Uh, to our Navajo people, one of the most sacred things that we have is our language. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons that you are sitting here tonight is because uh, the Navajo was used as a code during World War II and it was the only code that wasn't broken uh, throughout the war. And so it's a, it's a very sacred gift that our country, our, our tribe was even able to give to our country. And as a Christian, of course, the word of God is very sacred and very dear to me. And so I have two CDs here. They're the same CD, I just wanted to give you multiple copies. And they are one of my elders uh, back on the reservation who has begun to sing the songs the, the words of scripture in a traditional Navajo way. And so this, this CD has uh, the story of creation, it has some of the Psalms, it has some other stuff about the Old Testament tabernacle, other parts about Jesus, and it is just our gift of our tribe singing the songs of the scriptures to you in Navajo. And so, Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you very much to the CCDA family. The second thing I wanted to do tonight, uh, because the Navajo culture is a matrilineal culture, and uh, when you are, your identity comes through your mother. And so when you are honored, you honor your mother, and you honor your mother's mother. And, um, all of us know uh, John Perkins as the founder and the father of this organization. But I want tonight to honor Vera May. And I have not had the opportunity to speak with Vera May near as much as, I, as I've had the opportunity to speak with John. I have heard her speak and I have given her some hugs at numerous times, but I wanted to give her a gift tonight of this necklace that I have been wearing. And our, our people are known around the world for the rugs that we weave and the silversmithing that we do and the turquoise that we make, or that we, that we put together into necklaces. And this was given to me by one of my relatives for many years. I wear it almost every time I use my regalia. And I wanted to give it tonight to Vera May as a way to say, Shamasana Achiha, which means my grandmother, thank you. In CCDA now, we are a very rich family. Thank you, my brothers. We're a rich family. We have so much diversity here, so many different blends of faith, blends of Christianity, denominations, people from all over the world, and yes, people that were here in this country before we came to this country, many of us. We have another history that is negative. Of course, the Native Americans were here before we came as Europeans, and when we came, we did steal their land and killed their people. But there's another group of people that we've been very, very rude and disrespectful of, and of course, that is what we now call the African American that we participated in going over to another continent and stealing people and taking people there and bringing them to this country 
as a slave. I hope and pray that we in CCDA will begin the process and continue the journey of reconciliation. One of the R's is reconciliation. And reconciliation often comes with a price. It comes with being uncomfortable. Whenever you or I have gone anywhere to do something cross-culturally or anywhere that we feel a little bit uncomfortable, it's often very difficult. John Perkins, when he was beaten in the Brandon jail, a fork stuck up his nose. It was on that floor of the jail that he made a commitment that if Jesus Christ was truly real and if he was truly Christ, that he was going to love white people and others across racial lines. We at CCDA have a rich family. And because of that family, we get to be together. Let's not take this too lightly. Now, every year in the summer, I do a study leave. And Lawndale Community Church is very good to Ann and I. And I usually tell you a couple books, and sometimes I do more. But there's two books I read this summer that I would highly recommend. One is called Brainwashed by Tom Burrell from Chicago. He's an advertising publicity person who looked at the understanding of challenging the myth of black inferiority. It's a wonderful book to help us understand. And then the other book is The New Jim Crow. Michelle Alexander, in writing this, has shown that the New Jim Crow today is putting people in prison. And so those two books, I think, would be a, a good read for any of us here in CCDA. When we first started CCDA, there were almost no books available to help us on our journey. We had a couple of Johns, and then John has continued to write. But we've encouraged all of you to write books. I love that so many of you are writing books about your story, about what you're learning. And, of course, one of those people that has had the gift of writing is Bob Lupton. And Bob Lupton has written many things, and he has, a, a, for a time, when he wrote his weekly urban perspective on what it's like to live in inner city Atlanta, and he wrote that in a letter. It was kind of the lifeblood of Ann and myself, and we would read it every month when it would come. And Bob has a new book. It's called Toxic Charity. And I've had the chance to, to peruse it and to go through it, and I think it's going to be something that will be very helpful to us. And so I, I do highly recommend Toxic Charity. I'm excited about all the seminaries, and we had about 10 seminaries represented here and, and how we begun to come together to do training. I'm in Chicago, and so I've partnered, and Lawndale Community Church and CCDA have partnered with Northern Seminary out in Lombard, and we've brought a campus into the inner city, into Lawndale. And so we now have seminary classes in Lawndale. And we have a Doctor of Ministry degree in Christian Community Development, and you can get a doctorate in understanding. John Perkins and myself direct that program. We also have a Master's of Divinity with an emphasis in Christian Community Development, of which we have eight full-ride, 100% scholarships that are called the John Perkins Fellowship. We are committed to education, and we must continue that. But then there are our sisters and brothers who've never gone to college, and we want to be sure they can get theological training, so we developed a certificate in urban ministry and theology. Continue to push the seminaries and the colleges around you to do similar things as what we're doing in Chicago. We could not be here tonight. I couldn't be here without talking about my brother, Glenn. Most of you know that Glenn K. Ryan is one of our founders. A founding board member is still a board member. Some of you may not know that Glenn's not with us right now, is that he has contracted cancer. He's in treatment. He and Lonnie, and of course their young son that they've adopted, Cy, are hopeful and prayerful. But I just want to take a moment, now, I'm not going to pray out loud, but I want you to pray for Glenn, Lonnie, Cy, and all of Circle Rock community in the Austin area of Chicago. Would you just take a moment before we continue and pray for Glenn and his family?
Father, we lift these prayers for Glenn and his family to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, innovation is the subject of our conference. And some of us that are getting older, innovation seems like uh, a foreign word almost. You know, the older you get, the more stuck in your ways you get. You know, you old, the, old, the old saying is, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And I guess I'm an old dog. And it's a little bit difficult for us. Now, I'm trying, and I'm get, trying my best to get on this journey of innovation. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm started to do uh, Twitter. So I got me a Twitter account, and I, 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 and about two weeks ago, not this week, but the week before when I was preaching, I decided that I'm going to tweet, all right? And so I, I went out there, and I sent a tweet out, and I, and I, I talked about, if you want to know something, and it was about my sermon, come to Lawndale Community Church tomorrow at either 9 or 11.30. So I'm kind of proud of myself that I got a count uh, you know that I tweeted and all that stuff and so I, I decided to tell the church about it you know because none of them are following me I got three followers and Austin and Angela but you know uh, but anyway I I, I I told the church that I'm, I'm I'm now I tweeted yesterday and I now have a tweeter account and they and and I said yeah you know I, I'm a, I've got a tweeter account and I'm gonna be tweeting and 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 all of a sudden the whole church starts hollering and screaming at me I mean you all are polite all right and they and they saying it's not tweeter Twitter tw-. you know they're trying to help me understand I don't know what it is but I'm gonna try I'm gonna try and and innovation is good but innovation is not always good just for innovation's sake And I think sometimes we try to be innovative, and with our innovation, we might miss some of the foundations of what's important. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about some of the foundations that we have. I think the eight key components, they might need to be tweaked a little bit. They might need something that we look at. They might need us to reword them a little bit. But the eight key components of Christian community development have have been shown themselves to be true and shown themselves to be worthy. The principles of Christian community development work. They work in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. They work in Nairobi, Kenya. They work on the west side of Chicago. And they work in your community. And so I I encourage you to stay with that and to stay with Christian community development as you move forward. Now, one of the most innovative things that we did at Lawndale, and we did this a number of years ago, that when we were in it, we were practicing one of the eight key components, which was listening to the community. The community told us that there is no place to have a sit-down family meal in Lawndale. There were no sit-down restaurants in our whole community at dinner time. At that time, we didn't even have a McDonald's. There just weren't restaurants, and about 60,000 people didn't have access to going out to dinner in the evening. So we began to think and pray as a church and as a ministry, and, and we ran into the Melnatis. Now, Lou Melnatis is the best deep dish pizza in the world, all right? Y'all need to know that. And when you come to Chicago, don't go to the, those, those inferior. There was a pizza on Food Wars. There was this pizza between the best in Chicago. It was unanimous. Lou Melnatis was the winner. So we got the very best. We met, the Melnati brothers are Christians, so we said, why don't you come open up a restaurant here? And, and they, they weren't very interested in it. They said, if we do that, you're just going to mess up everything. You've been messing up all these economic things that you did. We started a welding business, and we flushed that down the toilet. $100,000 we flushed down the toilet trying to do a welding business. We tried a window shade business. That didn't work. We, 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 we've done many things. And we, he said, the Melnati said, you're never going to be able to do it. We're not doing that, but then they made a fatal mistake. They opened up their ninth pizzeria. Now, I don't know about you, but when I know think nine, I think ten very quickly. And that is exactly one-tenth. They got a tenth left to go, and I said, wow. So I called them together. We had a little meeting, and I said, you know what? It's time that you guys become biblical in the way you run your business. And I said, they said, well, what do you mean? We try to have biblical principles. I said, well, what you need to do now is that you need to open up your next restaurant, which will be your tenth. That needs to be your tithe restaurant. 
And then I took them into the Old Testament. And you know, Solomon was not allowed to use tithe money for building the temple. The tithe money in the Old Testament had two specific things it could be used for. It could be used for the priests and the Levites, and it could be used to care for the poor. As a matter of fact, every three years, 100% of the tithe went to care for the poor. And so when we talked to the Melnatis, that began to get to their heart. Sure enough, we opened up a Lou Melnatis in Lawndale. I remember talking to John Perkins uh, early on, and it, you know maybe even you know in the weeks uh, that Malnati's had just opened, and I asked him. I said, John, what's the most important thing that we can you know that we can do here? He said, and I'll always remember this. He said, the most important thing a man can have in his life is a job. There's no reason to throw money in this community. There, you know, there, it, it, it just does good for a short, short season. But if you can provide a man a job, you're giving him a road to dignity. It is unbelievable what we're seeing happening around us. And to just to, to feel that um, uh, God used Malnati's to play a little small part in all that is... You know, it, it's it's just breathtaking to me. Now, when we are getting ready to open up Melnati's, Mark and Rick said to me one day, they said, now, you know, we're going to open in a couple weeks. So when we open, we've been having a discussion around the office, and we're not sure what we ought to do with the profits on a tithe restaurant. You know, what are we going to do with this, with this profits of this restaurant? Because it's kind of a little bit different as we're opening it up in, in Lawndale where there are no restaurants. And so I, I, I learned from Jesus. Jesus often does not answer the question. But he often, when he's asked a question, he asks a question back. So I said to the Melnati brothers, well, what do you think you should do with the prophets on a tithe restaurant? <laughs> and they said, well, we probably shouldn't keep them. I said, probably not. <laughs> and they said, well, what would you think if we donated them back to the church and the ministry so that you could do more work in the community? I said, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> so they made a commitment in 1995, it opened up while we were at the conference in Denver, and we had the pizzeria open, it got started, hiring people, literally we used it for job training, we've helped over a hundred men come through Lou Melnati's and work. Daryl, who was up on the keyboard, used to work at Lou Melnati's. Now he's working on his Doctor of Ministry degree at Northern Baptist Seminary. We've used Melnati's to help people learn to work, but on the other side of the coin, after year one, we had not yet shown a profit. As a matter of fact, Mark Melnati came by the office one day and he said, you know what, we're not doing very well. Not only are we not making a profit, we lost a lot of money last year. And he said, you know, we lost $170,000 on this restaurant. He said, coach, let me write you a check right now for $170,000 and let's shut this thing down. And I said, Mark, if you gave us $170,000, I don't think there's any way we could do as much good with that money as this restaurant, as a sign of hope, is already doing in our community and training others to work. So we stayed at it. Mark, for the... Year after year after year, we began to whittle that down. Do you know we finally showed a profit? You, many of you have heard me say over and over again, if you're going to go somewhere and you're going to move into the inner city and you're going to do ministry, I often say you need, if you're not going to go there for 15 years, don't even go. You know how many years it took to show a profit at Lou Malnati's? 15 years. It was the 15th year that we finally made a profit. 
It was only $9,000, but it felt really, really good. You know what? That principle that I think we need to think about is it takes time. Some of you are in a hurry. Some of you want to start a church and have 10 people there for the first Sunday. The second Sunday you want 20. The third Sunday you want 40. Then you want 80. Then you want 100. So you just want to grow like crazy. You want to get way ahead of what God's... When you go too quickly, you don't build the proper foundation. Take your time and stay with it. Most things fail because they didn't give it enough time to succeed. Don't be too quick to pull the plug on some of the things that you believe God has called you to do. Remember, it takes time for those things to happen. Nickels aren't worth much today. We, they're kind of a measly little piece of coin. Most of the time you put it in a jar or give it away to somebody, you're always looking to give away that cheap change. But that measly nickel can mean something. You know, there was a, a boy about 11 years old down in rural Mississippi one day, and he went out in a hay field and he, and he baled hay all day long. And when he got done, he thought, you know, he would probably make about a dollar and a half or two dollars for, for the work that he did. This was over 50 years ago, 60 years ago. When he got done, this young African-American boy went to the owner of the man of the, he'd been working in the hay field for, and the man gave him a dime and a measly little nickel. That man's name was John Perkins. But you know, if you've heard John talk, you realize that John took that little dime and that nickel, and it, he learned a lesson out of that. He learned that what he needed to do if he was going to be successful is that he had to get, why did he, who was going to control the economy? Those that control the means of production. Who owns the mule? Who owns the field? Who owns the wagon? That's who is going to make money. And that propelled John into understanding redistribution as we are. There was another woman that grew up in poverty out in California. Six Girls in the family, two boys, their mother, and didn't have hardly anything. But Mrs. Golightly next door, every time she would come home and this little girl would be out there, she would give this little girl a nickel. And she, when she gave her that nickel, she said, this is an investment in you because you are a special person. And the little girl would run home and she would get a jar and she put it in that jar. And as she put it in that jar, Mrs. Golightly continued to give her those nickels until that jar filled up. One day, the little girl looked in there and saw all those nickels, and she thought, I must be special. And she went on then and graduated from college, went to law school, graduated from law school, went to Washington, D.C., and became the executive director of the National Black Caucus, and then continued on in her work, in her ministry, and now she is the chairperson of CCDA. That's Barbara Williams Skinner that that happened to. You see, the little things that happen in our lives, there's lessons to be learned in the small things that you're doing. Don't think you've got to be big all the time. Big is not always better. And when something small is going on, you can learn. There's lessons to be learned as John learned. And there's people to encourage with little things. Are you doing the little things in your ministry? Do you talk to the people that are below you, that are not even your direct reports, but four, five layers down? Are you doing the little things when you walk by the sidewalk and there's paper on the ground? Do you stoop down and pick up the paper? Are you doing the little things to encourage other people? Little things, small things matter. Jesus said, if you're not faithful in the little things, you won't be faithful in the big things. Be faithful, and let's be faithful. Now, we come to CCDA, and we get all excited. We all do. 
This has been such a fantastic conference. I'm excited. I mean, it's just been, it's just been a wonderful time. But often when you go home, there can be a down. Last year after CCDA, a couple weeks after CCDA, I, I found myself very discouraged. And I couldn't quite figure it out. And another week went by and I was still discouraged. And another week went by and I was just, it was, it was getting hard for me to do some things. And so finally, one morning when I was journaling, I said, why am I struggling so much? What's going on? And so I thought, let me write in my journal the difficult things that are going on in my life. But in order to make my list, I did a little thing with God. I said, I'm not going to write something down unless it's harder than my normal hard. And we all have normal hards. Every day there's some hard things. So in order to make my list, it had to be harder than the normal hard. So I started writing. And when I got done, I surprised myself. There were 29 things on that list that I was experiencing in my own life that were harder than the normal hard. And there was one thing on the list that was harder than probably all the others of them put together. I didn't talk about it much at Lawndale. I did share with our board and ask them to pray for me, but most people had no idea. But last year, if I was going to talk about it, I would say it was my year of discouragement. As a matter of fact, I've had some discouragement in the last three or four years, but last year was a really hard year for me. It was hard. And we do have, sometimes it's really hard. There were times when I would be ready to preach at Lawndale, and I would be sitting there in the front row, and my wife was sitting, Ann was sitting next to me. And I, I, bowed, I would just put my head down. I don't think hardly anybody in our church knew I was going through this. But Ann knew, and I got through many a sermon because of Ann. And she would put her hand on my back, and she would just rub it before I would go to preach. And when she did that, I knew that I wasn't alone, and I knew I could do it. Our family, Angela, our daughter, Andrew and his wife Stacy, our son, and Austin, our youngest boy, our family, they helped me get through it, even though the kids probably didn't know much about it, but they could see, they could see, and they were there. But also, the people of Lawndale, and particularly the children. When I would, when I would be very discouraged, I would walk through the children's program, and I would see the faces, and I would see the children, and they would, they would encourage me. Don't think that you're above being down and discouraged. And I was discouraged for the whole year. And it was only until this fall I started to come out of that. Family and church friends. It's the importance of the church. Please be a part of the local church where you have family and friends and people who can journey with you even if they don't know what you're going through. Church Family, friends are very important in this journey. Now, if you have your Bible, you can turn it. It's on the screen. But I want to look at a couple passages of Scripture with you. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, simply reads like this. And the expert in the law came and said, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is, is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The parallel passage to that, of course, is Matthew chapter 22. The great commandment to love God with everything we have and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now there's something, if we go to the Luke passage, and I want you to, the Luke chapter 10 passage, now I'm going to read this and I want you to listen what's different about this one. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, the expert in the law answered, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, very quickly, what's different about this passage and the other? Well, there's a couple major differences that are there. Let me point them out to you. I'm sure you would get it if you studied this. But the first thing is, is that it's, it's a little bit different. First of all, the expert in the law comes and asks Jesus and asks him a different question. It's different than Mark 12, different than Matthew 22. The question he asks is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus says, you know the law. I don't know. Maybe he was there when it happened in Matthew or Mark. Maybe he was there for that. I happen to think this was probably two incidents, not the same one. Maybe Jesus looked out and saw him and thought, oh, you were there, you know the answer. So he says, well, you know the law, you know what it is. What do you think is the answer to inherit eternal life? And the expert in the law said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and with love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do you see a difference there? First of all, he answers the question, but secondly, it's not, and the second is like it. He understood that Jesus said there's a second one that's just like the first, which means we can't just do love God and not love our neighbor, and we can't just love our neighbor and not love God. Both are equally important, and in this particular case, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. He puts the two together. Now, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. If you do this, if you love God with everything you have and you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you will inherit eternal life. In other words, this is the essence of what Christianity is. John's been talking in our Bible study about discipleship. And you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ and not love God and not love your neighbor. It's not about the quote-unquote getting saved gospel. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus only talks about salvation in the New Testament about seven times. But do you know how many times he looks and tells somebody, if you want to be my disciple, come and follow me. Seventy times in the New Testament he says, follow me. Take up your cross, deny yourself daily, and follow me. And when we follow him, we then love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, I'm so glad that he asked this next question in verse 29. Because we really don't know who our neighbor is. We read that with American eyes. Love our neighbors, we love ourselves. The American definition, look in the dictionary of our neighbor, is somebody that lives next door to you, somebody that lives in close proximity, somebody on your block, somebody down the street, somebody on your cul-de-sac, somebody at least in your neighborhood. That's who we think is our neighbor. And so he says, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus then tells a story. He doesn't just say your neighbor is this person or that person. And what does he say? In, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of the robbers they stripped him of his clothes they beat him and they went away leaving him half dead now we often call this the story of the good Samaritan but I think we mislabel it it's not about the Samaritan the Samaritan does not answer the question the question is who is the man beaten up on the side of the road who is that man love our neighbor who is our neighbor our neighbor is the man beaten up on the side of the road, stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Who is my neighbor? If we want to know who our neighbor is, we must spend some time looking and asking and studying who is that person beaten up on the side of the road. Now, when you start to look at that, and I've been looking at that for a long time, over 25 years, I've been studying this passage. And as I've been studying this passage, all kinds of things have, have come out to me. You know, who is the, you think about who's the man beaten up on the side of the road. The first thing that would come up is that he's somebody that's hurting. So any human being that you ever come across in your life that's hurting, that's our neighbor. Who's my neighbor? My neighbor is somebody that has been stripped. When you are stripped, you're degraded. Who do you know that has been stripped of their dignity because of something in life? Who do you know that has been cast aside? Jesus says, that's my neighbor. 
When we look at the man beaten up on the side of the road, we realize that that was somebody that, what? You know the story. The priest and the Levite passed by. Who is that man on the side of the road? He's somebody that nobody wants to help. Who do you know in your community? Who do you walk by fairly regularly that everybody's given up on? Nobody wants to help. That, Jesus says, is my neighbor. My neighbor is somebody of a different race. Makes reconciliation real. Almost every scholar believes that the man beaten up on the side of the road, which makes this story so dramatic, was a Jewish person. And a Jew would not speak to a Samaritan. A Jew would definitely not have stopped to help a Samaritan. So, But when the Samaritan stops to help a Jew who hated him, my neighbor is somebody that hates me. My neighbor is somebody of another race that I would know I wouldn't even want him to help me. Who's our neighbor? Our neighbor is somebody dramatically different. And in the study, and many of you know I wrote the book, Who is My Neighbor? I've got 40 characteristics from my 20 years of study that's in that book to help us. But if we can't obey that command of loving our neighbor if we continue to think. Now, most of you in CCDA are right in the midst of doing all of that, of loving people. And that's when you are obeying the great commitment. But let's now think for a moment about loving God. Loving God. The number one way we love God, it says in John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Obedience, God says, is better than sacrifice. Obedience. If you want to grow in your faith, obey what you know. You don't have to worry about the stuff in Scripture you don't understand or you don't know. Just start obeying what you know. Love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but love God with all of our heart, all of our strength, all of our mind, all of our energy, everything we have, we love God. But we also love God when you're in love with somebody, you want to be with them. When Ann and I were dating, it was crazy. She was in Ohio. I'm in Chicago. She teaches school in Ohio. I teach school in Chicago. You know what we did? Every weekend we're driving to try to meet. We met here in Indianapolis because it was about halfway for both of us. And her parents lived here. So most of my dating was under the, the, the watchful eye of Ann's dad. But we met. We wanted to be there. One night we were so crazy. We were so in love. We just wanted to be in touch with one another. We didn't. This was when long distance was expensive. We stayed on the phone all night long. We weren't. We folks fell asleep. But I said, honey, why don't you leave the phone by your ear? You know? And, 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 you know, and I can hear you breathe. And then when I start snoring, you'll hear me snoring. And all night. And our bill was $100. But we were close to each other. Oh, I loved it. I'm still happy about that one. It was the best $100 I ever spent. But when you love somebody, you want to be with them any way you possibly can. And I love my wife. Oh, I love my wife. I wish y'all knew my wife. Oh. Ephesians 3.20, when I met her, is what I wrote and quoted that God is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond anything I've ever asked or dreamt of. When, Aunt, when God gave me Ann and Ann moved to Lawndale with me, you all know the story probably. I wrote about it in Real Hope in Chicago. The first night we were married, we're living in Lawndale. We come back from our honeymoon. We go to our apartment. We go to bed at night. We wake up. We go to church. We come back. Our house had been broken into. And her parents had never seen our apartment. Her dad had never been to Lawndale. He happened to be flying in from a vacation. We pick him up at the airport. And when I showed up with Ann and her mom and dad at our front door, the door had been kicked in. And we had, our stuff had been stolen, everything of value. We got Ann's parents bedded down that night. And at the end of that time, I remember going back. We, Ann and I were sleeping on the floor in the back room. And I said, honey, I love you but I think I made a mistake. I don't think we should probably live in Lawndale. Everybody told me, don't bring in, don't bring a woman to live here and all that stuff. And I'm kind of hard-headed. And Ann, I said, honey, I think we should move. Ann looked at me that night and she said, honey, I love you and I want to live here. 
Anne has been faithful to the vision, faithful to me for the past 34 years. And I thank God for my wife. Thank you, honey. But that's how I want to long for God. I want to have that kind of longing for God Almighty. I want to love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind. I want to love God with everything that I have. And that's what he expects from us. Father Beshoy, who you met the other day, he lives in the oldest monastery. Here he is in the whole world. In the fourth century, St. Anthony moved there. Here he is outside of his cell. His cell is smaller than your bathroom. That's where he lives, and he loves it because that's where he goes to be alone with God. But he also has a cave up in the mountain, and I told you, he goes up there for seven weeks and fasts and prays. This is St. Anthony, the first monk in the history of the world. This is the cave in, off the Red Sea in Egypt that you would go into, that St. Anthony went into. St. Anthony spent over 60 years praying and being alone with God in a cave. This is the inside of the cave. I went in there and I, I prayed and I sat there myself with a new sense of awe. He stayed there one time for 39 years without leaving in solitude and in silence. That's the view outside of the cave. Now in Lawndale, we have a thing called Triple S 3P. And I wanna introduce you to it and we'll be done. Triple S 3P simply means the three S's are solitude, silence, and scripture. Solitude means, of course, getting alone. In some years, I've asked you, to make a commitment in your heart, not a show of hands, not something show, not walk down and stand in front of everybody, but I've asked you to join me and join many others to spend one hour a day, every day, alone with God. And some of you are doing it. If you wanna do Christian community development, the most important thing that I believe without any question that you can do is spend time alone with God. I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you tonight to spend time alone with God. Solitude, silence. Don't, it's all the time, you know, you call it a quiet time, but you're so noisy in your quiet time, you don't know what silence is. Go and sit and be alone. Psalm 46, 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. Sit quietly. Read scripture, read the Bible, and then pray. And prayer is not just talking to God, it's also listening to God. And then praise. Praise can be singing a song, praise can be reading a psalm. Praise can just be sitting there raising your hands, it can be bowing your head, it can be on your knees. One habit that I started this year in my discouragement was every day to say, God, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Praise the Lord. And then put it in writing. It's a, I'm not a very good writer, but I, I have a cheap old spiral notebook. And every morning when I get up, this morning, my day was running hectic but I sat down in my hotel room here, and I, you know, I, was, I, was, I was uneasy in my spirit after last night. I didn't sleep very well last night. I got up, and when I got up, the first thing I did, as I always do, is I get my journal out and I start to write. And I wrote about one sentence. It didn't even matter. Before I wrote down, I always write the day and the date and the time. Just always, that's what I do. And then all of a sudden, as soon as I had those three things in, a peace came over me because I'm in my time alone with God. Put some things down in writing. Talk about what's going on. I use code words so if anybody, my journal is not to be published like John Wesley's or anybody else. My, my family has strict, strict orders. When I die, burn them, okay? I don't want anybody reading what I wrote. And if I'm writing about something sensitive, I use code words, all right? But put something in writing. We have a card for you, and this is, this is my gift to you tonight. Hopefully you all got it. Lawndale Community Church people were passing. If not, go by the Lawndale table. On one side are the eight key components. On the other th side is triple S 3P. Put it in your Bible. Maybe it'll be a reminder of you to spend 
time alone with God. Would you pray with me tonight? And at the end of our time of prayer, I know this is kind of hard for us as CCDA to do. Don't, don't, please don't clap for me. In fact, I'm going to ask you not to talk until you get outside the doors. Some of you might want to sit and be alone with God for a few moments. And we can only do it for five or ten minutes if you want to stay that long, but you may only want to stay five seconds or 30 seconds. But if you want just a little time alone with God in some solitude and silence, let's just sit quietly at our seat. When you're ready to go, if you would not speak until you get outside the doors. And let's be still and know that God is God. Amen.